Okay. Well, that helps a lot, Frank. Hopefully uh, everyone else uh, agrees that that's a really good coverage of that topic there. Um, now, next uh, question we have here on the chat is, if two people share ownership of property, can both claim general executor of that part of the estate, or would they say co-executor, or one of them that have to be co-executor? Okay. Well, the the way to view it, and it's an ex- excellent question, um, they would be, uh, you can only have one general executor, so that's important to, to recognize. You only have one general executor of the estate, but you can have two co-executors of the estate. So it's perfectly fine that if you are in a position, let, let's, let's say that um, you're dealing with a company, for example, or a corporate trust. Now, if you are uh, in a company or a corporate trust, of course, there can be more than one director. So therefore, there can be more than one executor. So you would be a co-executor. Um, but at the same time, remember, you can have a managing director. So you could have, um, you could nominate someone that is effectively the managing director or the chairman, uh, and that role effectively would then become the general executor. So it, it really is a matter of how you arrange the authority within that group. And if you're in a corporate trust or you're in a family trust, then the husband and wife uh, would then may regard themselves as co-executors. Uh, if you're in a um, company with five directors, then you might have four uh, co-executors and one general executor. So it really depends upon the arrangement of the entity um, to decide. But I hope that clears that up. Yeah? Yeah, I think that helps. Makes sense. Um, I'm not sure here if we want to cover the state. There's a question here for I guess seven. Um, so, uh, so here's well, I'm not sure if this, this is a question for you, but let's read it out just to see if it is. So we could look at this executor or employer. Uh, as the employer, trustees as employees. If our employees don't do their job or something illegal against um, the company, we can charge them or sue them. Is that correct? Well, the the immunity in their system, of which they hide behind at many, many levels, only functions when they perform their duties. The minute you can hold them to account in breaching their duties, uh, the immunity set ends. So I'll give an example. Uh, for a judge, when a judge ceases to function as a public trustee in good faith, now the in good faith is really important because it's written into all the immunity statutes. When a judge ceases to act in good faith uh, in their office of a public trustee, a public servant, then their immunity from personal liability ends. That means they're, they're personally liable, and that applies to pretty much any public servant. So the answer is yes. If they don't do their job, if they don't perform their fiduciary duties, yes, you can sue them and you can have them charged, absolutely. Well, where you have the greatest standing to do that is when you are make sure that you are have made them aware that you are the general executor and that at that point, you have rebutted their presumptions. And when that is made known, you have great standing to continue on uh, on holding them to their oath and their duties for that office. So, uh, and they would be personally liable for acting under color of law or going against their oath and acting under color of law, so, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it gives you greater standing once you, when you especially use the uh, general executor, and you've rebutted that. Well, this enough. is why it's so important to do it properly. Look, if you if you don't give them the opportunity, it, it, being the general executor is about behaving in honour, respect, and being a teacher, being a leader, 
and, and not seeking revenge or playing their tricks. So if you don't give them the opportunity, then you can't claim that they've breached their duty. And they can always say, and the first thing they'll say to you, you know, when you hold them account is, you, you put them in the spotlight and say, I didn't know. And in many respects, it's true. Until you stand up and give public notice and do it properly as to your role as being a general executor, then, then they have every right to say, well, you know, you didn't tell us that you were willing to stand up and uh, accept the responsibility. And it is a responsibility. I mean, being a general executive means you've got to behave properly. You've got to be a leader of the community. You've got to help people. You've got to help yourself. You've got to, you know, stop blaming others. You've got to start being the one ultimately where the buck stops. The reason you can enforce policy when public trustees uh, don't do the right thing is as general executor, ultimately it's your job to make sure that do the right thing. And I'll give you one example where this really, really matters. One way to view the way the world is today is because we haven't done our job properly. If we had done our job properly collectively over the centuries, then we would never have allowed the bankers and these public servants to run rampant and out of control. But because we took our eye off the ball and because we accepted the bribes and gifts and other things that they gave to us, we let them do what they wanted to do. So as general executor, it carries a high price. Let no one think otherwise. It is you becoming accountable for what is going on on this planet, what's going on in your community, and to behave appropriately. And I hope, you know, I hope people embrace that. Hmm. A powerful thought there, Frank. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I think that's really one of the, one of the things that, that does uh, help set and correct the record. Uh, this, this goes back to over a year ago when we were really at that point of correcting the record. So um, this, this pretty much even refines what we had discussed way back then. Um, all right, next question on the banking system. To beat them at court and claim funds from escrow, is it possible in Australia without buying a Winston Strout DVD? <laughs> yeah. That's a uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a trick question. Uh, yeah. The answer is yes. The answer is yes, but look, um, there is a technical word used. It's called a, a tracing. Uh, one um, uh, seeks a tracing from the public trustees as to a particular trust, and they need to provide that to you. But it's all about how you behave. Now, I, I, I want to say one thing on that, and that is that before we made clear on the origin of the settlement birth certificate, there has been a large body of people who have been convinced that the birth certificate is like a Wonka golden ticket and that if they could just find the way to use it, they could get a lifetime supply of chocolate or something else valuable. But I'm um, you know, obviously making an analogy here, but what I'm saying is there are people who even today are telling those that are listening to them, your birth certificate is worth a great amount of money. It is a ticket to riches. There is a double-edged sword here. If you want to pursue the tracings and, and accounts of trusts in terms of the administration done by the public trustees, you have to become more active and competent in your community. There is no free ride. If anyone thinks they can send a document in and by going alakazam, you know, abracadabra, that there's something going to have a pot of gold, they've got to stop following those kind of things. This is not going to unlock some great fortune. If you pursue this, you're up for a lot of work, and in particular, up for 
really showing that you are a executor uh, of your estate and a pillar of your community. And if you're not, then the public trustees will not act accordingly. So I want to make that very clear. Yes, absolutely. The answer is yes, you can without buying a DVD. But remember what I said. The world is the way it is because we have failed to act as we should as executors. Yes. Well, again, in the truth, uh, you know, seeking truth and um, seeking the relief and remedies, the those kinds of things have been hidden for quite some time. You know, we, we've known we've had to come out and rebut presumptions, but it was really the uh, the fullness of what that entails, what that task is, and what were the presumptions. And, you know, you helped bring that forward, so um, that helps a lot. Um, all right, next question. Uh, earlier you mentioned universities when you were talking about Russia and USA at trading shipping goods. Um, and this guest, the reception went out. So could you elaborate on that discussion earlier? And do you think this ties in with network where the CEO talks about a world that is a college of corporations? Absolutely. I, I do believe that this is part of their structure of control. And I was mentioning the Rorick Pact. Uh, what I'll do is to just to save time and to make it easier, uh, I'm going to ask the administrator on the University of Eucadia that there is a, a uh, section there uh, under information that will uh, provide some background to the meaning of the symbol and uh, the Rorick Pact itself uh, and its uh, relationship to uh, structures in, in the concept of using uh, corporations as colleges and colleges being part of universities and countries being universities. By the way, we, we have in fact adopted this language in UK already in terms of describing universities and uh, provinces and campuses. And I will spend more time in other chats about this. And the reason we've adopted this language is that the words themselves uh, denote uh, stronger words than nations and states and it is a structure that is superior in terms of sharing knowledge than, than trying to mimic uh, some kind of quasi one world order, new world order, by you know, creating unions and nations and states. Um, so there will be a section on University of Acadia about that symbol and the Rorick Pact and its use. And uh, I look forward to sharing more in the future when we have these charters ready to download where you can go and look and see why we why we use the word university? Why are we using the word province? Okay. All right, Frank. Very good. Thank you. Well, with that, uh, looks like that was our last question. And if unless you have any others, and if you want to do a wrap up, we can call it a night. And are we on for next week? Yes, we are. I just got a late call, and I'm just going to um, qualify what I just said. Um, the use of the uh, symbol um, as a banner of peace and its connection uh, to the Rorick Pact does not, shouldn't be construed by anyone saying uh, Eucadia wishes to join the Rorick Pact. So I just got that notice there <laughs> from, uh, uh, from one of the administrators of, of uh, Eucadia. So if I, if I create that impression, I want to make sure. Uh, the use of that symbol does not mean that Eucadia is trying to become a member of the Rorick Pact. So again, we'll get that section cleared up so people can see. Look, the wrap up tonight, we covered a lot. There are a lot of questions, but I'm glad we got through those questions. If I didn't get your question, please uh, look forward to posting it next week. I just think it's important to see that the information and the sharing of knowledge continues to accelerate. And rather than simply uh, putting a line in the sand and saying, that's it, the new information won't fit. Always we're trying to incorporate information. Always we're trying to test it. And always we're trying to get to the heart of remedy. I, I appreciate that many people 
are in desperate need,